Ten years ago, Romeo Dallaire led a team of UN peacekeepers into Rwanda on a mission of hope to restore peace to a war-torn land. But the mission failed, and close to a million people were slaughtered. Dallaire has always blamed himself for not stopping the genocide, and living with that guilt almost killed him. But now Dallaire has written a book, and while he still accepts some of the blame, he makes it clear there's more than enough to go around. Here's Carol Off with a feature report. The ordinary demands of life are now a comfort to Romeo Dallaire. Like the annual Quebec ritual of assembling the winter garage, his children, Catherine and Guy, look for chances to spend time with their father. They missed a lot during his years as a soldier, and again during his painful recovery, when nothing gave comfort, when his heart and mind were thousands of kilometers away in another land. Okay, so I see. Dallaire's searing memory of his time in that other land is now a book, Shake Hands with the Devil, The Failure of Humanity in Rwanda. He describes the machete-wielding government-sponsored forces who went on a killing spree in 1994, murdering 800,000 people in 100 days. It's a damning indictment of world leaders and UN bureaucrats who failed to stop the genocide. Even to write the story was painful. I think it's, it's having relived that year in Rwanda and the four months of the genocide through writing the book. I mean, I actually had to relive it. You can't write it unless you relive it. After Rwanda, Dallaire blamed himself for everything. He sank deep into despair. He attempted suicide. Three years ago, he sat on this park bench and drank from a bottle of alcohol. He's forbidden to drink because of the drugs he takes for depression. The mixture almost put him into coma. It was a low point in his life, but soon after he began to write the book and to give shape to the events that haunt him. He feels the park bench is behind him now. Dallaire has confronted the demons, some of whom were real life ones. They were devils. Uh, and I couldn't see Literally, it wasn't even just a, 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 not just using that metaphorically. Literally, oh, they, no, they no. It, it, I mean, it, uh, just as I know that there was a presence of a superior being on a couple of occasions present in a physical vibrating sense uh, to help me uh, go through some very very difficult moments uh, that same reality reality came about in in uh, in meeting or discussing with those people I was not discussing with humans they had they had erased themselves from that which which created in itself a, a dilemma you know uh, I think a very a uh, difficult ethical dilemma was, you know, do you negotiate with the devil? Uh, or do you just take your pistol and shoot him between the eyes? Did you think about that? Did you think at times that yeah. you just wanted to take out your gun and shoot them? And I describe it at one point in the book uh, uh, where I, uh, I walked in and I, for a second or whatever, uh, long enough to be conscious of it, I wasn't sure whether or not my man, my hand would go and take my pistol out or would move to, to shake their hand. Yeah, is, is that that strong? In one passage from the book, Dallaire describes a visit to a village, a favorite place he had hoped had not been wiped out by the genocidaire. They were all gone. I looked out over burnt huts, stump sills smoldering, carrion birds overhead, black lumps of rags moving ever so slowly downstream as others piled up on the curve of the river. I was filled with a sense of gross ineptness. I had come to paradise in full bloom and now, on my favorite hillside, I saw myself walking these hills and valleys. 
crossing streams and sitting in the shade of banana trees, talking without anybody be, being there, ripped apart by failure and remorse. I'd come to Kinahira looking for a little peace, but peace had been murdered here too. I remember that day. You are in the book, it's interesting, there are times when you say you shouldn't, there's no finger pointing, there's no, no help to point, point fingers and to lay blame. Other times you clearly say <laughs> Jacques. <laughs> yes. And so it's an interesting, you know, tension obviously with, within you as to who to blame. Who do I blame? Uh, I blame. Uh, I blame the lack of statesmanship. I, I blame the Americans' leadership, uh, which includes the Pentagon, uh, in in projecting itself as a world policeman one day and a recluse the next. In fact vulgarly stating even in General Assembly three weeks before the uh, the uh, Rwandan uh, uh, genocide and, and civil war starting I mean President Clinton saying in General Assembly that uh, that uh, through his proposition 25 uh, prevent uh, presidential directive uh, uh, proposition 25 that uh, the Americans will go in only if it's in their self-interest Dallaire's main line of communication with the world was through the Department of Peacekeeping Operations at the UN in New York City. Before the war began, Dallaire asked for leave to take preemptive action against those he suspected of plotting the genocide. New York told him to back off. Did you feel in any way let down by the peacekeeping office in New York, the way they responded to your initiative? Yes, I think uh, it, I think let down is a bit of a soft statement. Uh, Betrayed? Uh, well, we're getting closer to it. Uh, you know, undermined, uh, 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 poorly assessed, uh, um, putting into question maybe my own skills. You know, in the field as as the commander. Uh, Realizing what I what I was doing and the, and the full consequences of my of my actions. Your sense was is that they had regarded you as a cowboy. Well, that uh, came through from different uh, different sources, uh, but it it was very much like uh, um, I I wasn't uh, fully grasping uh, the depth of risk uh, to to my people uh, and. Uh, we had taken some high risks previously in moving the rebel battalion into Kigali and a number of things like that. But uh, it, it seemed to me like I was, I was being assessed as not having thought my plan out appropriately, recognizing that these soldiers are not mine. On the first night of the war, Rwandan government forces were murdering Tutsi and Hutu moderate politicians. Dallaire dispatched one unit of ten Belgian peacekeepers to secure the home of Rwanda's prime minister. The Belgians were by far the most experienced of his soldiers, but they were ambushed, taken prisoner, and later tortured, mutilated, and murdered. The whole battalion was pulled out of Rwanda while Belgian politicians and the Belgian public blamed Dallaire for failing to take care of his soldiers first, Rwandans second. Dallaire has always lamented those ten deaths, but in his book he says it was, overall, the Belgians who let him down. Uh, whether they'll say that I, I as the commander, uh, did not accomplish my duty particularly to those ten, uh, that will very much depend on where their heart and, and their uh, where their heart and their brain meet. Uh, and uh, but they will not be happy with what I write. Oh, there, there's no happiness there. 
it, it's uh, it's blunt and it's uh, and it's nasty and it's. Uh, uh, Why did you decide to be blunt and nasty with the Belgians on this? Because at the same time, they were my best. They had the potential to be so much more. Uh, they helped a lot, you know, other contingents, or what they could make available, but they could have been far more than what they were. Uh, they could have been uh, a, a leading uh, atmosphere amongst the troops and the contingents, and then ultimately being uh, indisciplined, uh, haughty, uh, unnecessarily aggressive, uh, bordering on racism, uh, and, and uh, even at times undermining the advancement of the, of the process. But if we, okay, the preferred option is to take the Mombasa... As the death toll mounted, General Dallaire submitted a detailed plan for a rapid reaction force. He needed 5,000 soldiers to dismantle the killing machine of the Genocidaire and to stop the Hutu power movement. Logistic movements. The UN Security Council rejected his plan. The United States even refused to acknowledge the genocide to avoid any legal obligations to help. We have every reason to believe that acts of genocide have occurred. How many acts of genocide does it take to make genocide? Um, Alan, that's just not a question that I'm in a position to answer. The true that the uh, that you have specific guidance not to use the word genocide in isolation, but always to preface it with this, uh, with this word, acts of. Um, I have guidance which, uh, which to which I, uh, which I try to use as best as I can. Um, I'm not, uh, I, I have, uh, there are, are formulations that we are using that we are trying to be consistent in our use of. Uh, but I hold those who could have uh, readily uh, participated in the exercise uh, for overtly, blatantly, uh, callously uh, saying no, we're not going to, we're not going to come in. I think they've got to, uh, the ones who could have, have got to be identified and and uh, and they are. Yes, uh, they are. are they, who are they? Who are they? Can you? Oh, the the, the United States uh, were, were part of it. Uh, France, uh, the British. Uh, I think that uh, uh, elements of the UN Secretariat. Dallaire finally got his troop reinforcements after the war and the genocide were over. By then, it was time for his farewell parade. Following Ghanaian military tradition, uh, we exchanged a white baton of command. Then I was escorted off the dais into an open 4x4. Two long ropes were stretched before the vehicle and all the officers took up positions along them. They pulled me out of the compound to the music of Old Lang Syne. When we came to a halt, Tico helped me out of the 4x4 for the ride to the airport. After a flurry of fraternal hugs all around, I was gone. I left Africa on August 20, 1994, nearly a year to the day from when I had first arrived in Rwanda, full of hopes for a mission that would secure lasting peace for a country that once had been a tiny paradise on Earth. You said once, many times actually, no one can play Pontius Pilate on this. No, no. No one. Including myself. Do you, do you blame yourself? I, I failed, yes. The mission failed. And they died by the thousands. A hundred thousands. Uh, yes, there is... There is n that's why the subtitle, eh? the failure of humanity, it, 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 it failed. It was, it was overridden by the devil, it was overridden uh, by the hatred and the racism and, and, and the fear and, uh, and, and, and all the 
incredible, uh, horrific ways that human beings can destroy other human beings. After Rwanda, Dallaire was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. In December of 1999, when he was 53, Dallaire was told he was not responding to treatment. The Canadian Forces medical staff reported that he was trying to kill himself through work. The Chief of Defence Staff told Dallaire he had to forget Rwanda or forget the Army. Dallaire was medically dismissed. And the medical report said it was just a, a very short phrase. And it said, uh, uh, General Dallaire uh, cannot command troops in any operation, or it, it cannot command troops in operations anymore. And my whole life had been commanding troops. And that's, that's when I fully realized the impact of what Rwanda had done to me is when I literally was not able to do what my whole career had um, taught me to do and uh, it was a, a terrible shock but I, uh, I was able to spend more time on Rwanda matters and so on and so uh, um, and on uh, mental health matters and, and uh, that just rapidly fill the void. Although I'd love to go back into the field and smell the diesel and the sound of the guns and, and being with troops. and uh, It's incredible how one becomes lonely for those people. Dallaire's military family is in his past. His own family is front and center. The children and his wife Elizabeth have worked to put the pieces back together over the past nine years. Dallaire will go to Harvard next year on a fellowship to the prestigious Carr Center where he will study and write about conflict resolution. He also works with the Canadian government on war-affected children and he's filled with a new idealism. No matter how idealistic the aim sounds, this new century must become the century of humanity. When we as human beings rise above race, creed, color, religion, and national self-interest and put the good of humanity above the good of our own tribe. For the sake of the children and of our future. Peu ce que vous, allons-y. For the national, I'm Carol Off.